I eat a lot of uh, healthy greens to get the nitric oxide to help to um, dilate my blood vessels. But I also want the question I want to ask is in addition to that, I have taken sustained release niacin in the past and I feel the flushing, which you know, my, my brain tells me that's a good thing because it's flexing my vessels and making them maybe more. Um, is there any downside with too much flushing? Is it a negative or a positive? I don't think that there is a downside to the flushing, but just that some people find it to be a nuisance. Um, for the very few people that I prescribe niacin for, because it's just not a medicine we, we use much anymore, um, just because there's not a lot of data demonstrating benefit for, for most people. If I do recommend niacin, I will recommend that somebody takes four baby aspirins and chews them about 30 minutes before taking the niacin, and that can help to decrease the flushing side effects. And thank you for that, Dr. Shankman. And we now have Melissa. Welcome, Melissa. Hi, thanks, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your time. So a few questions, please. Does coffee affect blood pressure? Um, I am plant-based uh, for about two years. And as of January, SOS free. Um, what would cause high blood pressure? Could it strictly be a lack of exercise and is walking good or do you need a more rigorous workout plan so many days a week? Thank okay. you. Um, walking is good exercise. Um, you know, depending where you're at, if you're somebody who's relatively fit and you can do something a little bit more vigorous than walking, then that's great. But walking is always a a good starting point for, um, for blood pressure. I, I think there were, there were a few questions in there. I'm going to try to remember them, but you had also asked about coffee and does coffee raise blood pressure? And yes, coffee does slightly raise blood pressure, but there are also some beneficial effects of coffee on the heart. So I, I tell my patients that if you enjoy coffee, drink your coffee, just don't turn it into a big sugary, messy beverage. That seems to make sense. Thank you very much for that. And now we have Paul coming in. Welcome, Paul. Uh, hi, thank you again. Um, uh, yes, doctor, I've been, um, instead of low dose aspirin, I've been using natokinase. What's, what's, do you know much about natokinase? Uh, everything I've read uh, really touts it highly. Um, it depends on what you're using the natokinase for. Blood flow. Okay. Um, Instead what, of the low-dose aspirin. Okay. It, it depends on what your indications for an aspirin would be. If you're um, somebody who's, who's had a cardiac event or you have known um, arterial disease, I would say you should be taking the, the aspirin. There really isn't, unfortunately, there isn't a lot of good data. Um, there's a, and there's a lot of data that shows that if you do have heart disease, um, that there is benefit from a baby aspirin, and we don't have that for natokinase. Okay, thank you, doctor. Thanks very much for that. And um, so again, if anybody else has a question, feel free to raise your hand. I'm going to jump into another one for now. And that is that, you know, some people are out there saying that the best oils are saturated fats, such as coconut oil and ghee and butter and lard. And what does the science say? The science would suggest that diets that are higher in those saturated fats tend to have an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, so I encourage my patients to stay away from those things. Got it. Um, thank you for clarifying that for everybody. Let's go to somebody with the first initial M. Uh, initials M-E, I just asked you to, there you go, hi. Hi. Um Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, my question is regarding, uh, I have a condition called left bundle branch blockage. And I am, uh, I also have a congenital uh, minor heart murmur. I've been vegan about uh, 30 years, uh, mostly whole food plant based. And I uh, just wanted to see if you have any recommendations regarding 
food or any specific things because my doctor said, I have no idea. And the research I've done in PubMed and elsewhere, there's very little that I've been able to find about it. Okay. I don't, I don't know that I have any specific recommendations um, regarding the conditions you described and in diet. Now you have a left bundle branch block, just to be clear, it's not a left bundle branch blockage. A left bundle branch block is a conduction abnormality of the heart. It's not a blockage. Um, as for the murmur, it really depends on what, what the murmur is due to. But um, if you sound like you've, you've done a lot of research on your own, I really don't have anything to add. It's, it is the uh, conduction issue. Yes, I know. Uh, and I'm just trying to understand, you know, how did that happen? Was I short on some minerals or something? No. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how did that happen? Because I've been active and healthy for my whole life. So sure. So a left bundle branch block is a electrical abnormality that can be a consequence of a condition of the heart. And that would that is something that should be investigated by, by a cardiologist um, with an echocardiogram and potentially stress testing um, to look for whether there is an underlying heart condition that is responsible for the left bundle branch block. But that said, there is a, there is a fraction of people who may have a left bundle branch block in a completely normal structure of their heart otherwise. Thanks, Dr. Shankman. And um, now we're going to go to Elaine. Hi, Elaine. Hi, how are you? Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Oh, okay. Uh, one quick question, and it probably, well, at one, thanks for a great presentation. And it may be a very silly question, but correlating your high blood, pl blood pressure and your LDL or your cholesterol, as you lower your cholesterol and get it down, shouldn't your blood pressure also come down? That's... That's a really good question. And that actually would make sense because the things that drive up cholesterol in many cases also drive up blood pressure. So yes, if you make changes that improve one, the other will probably also improve. Excellent. Thanks, doctor. And thanks for the great question, Elaine. And now we're going to go to Wayne. Welcome, Wayne. Thank you. I've been cycling for the last few years and usually without any problems, but recently I've had experienced uh, hypotension, a little bit of dizziness after cycling for about 30 minutes. And I've been reading about this and I see that post-exercise hypotension is not unusual, but I'm just curious why I'm not beginning to experience this and if there's anything that I can do to prevent this or minimize it. So you're asking about hypotension or low blood pressure yeah. after you exercise. So to be, I just want to understand, are you lightheaded or is your blood pressure low or both? Both, both, both. You're, you're checking checked. your blood pressure and yes. your blood pressure is low. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, it's about 10 I, millimeters to 50 millimeters drop that I experienced after comparing the blood pressure after 30 minutes of riding compared to when I start. And you're, and you're lightheaded as well. Sometimes I've now got to the point where I can detect it and I'll stop writing at that point, but yes. Okay. I think you definitely need to be seen by a doctor and have it evaluated further, but certainly start with the basics of making sure that when you are writing, that you are hydrating appropriately. Excellent. Thanks for that, Dr. Shankman. And looks like Stephen F is back. Welcome, Stephen. Hi, I'm back. Um, more questions about the standard. Oh, first of all, I knew a young fellow that was a pilot and he was going for his medical review and his cholesterol was up and he went to Costco and bought a 55 gallon jug of niacin and gave himself severe liver damage. Not good. Um, a question about the standard of care when it comes to angioplasty, mm -hmm. uh, found myself in the hospital, uh, with an, with a, cardiologist who did a high-speed CAT scan when they first came out years ago and gave me a clean bill. At that time, they were also pushing uh, angioplasty. And there was I don't know, something on my EKG that freaked everybody out. Next thing I know, I'm back, at, I'm back in the same emergency room. And, uh, and they were adamant. 
that, you know, it's, it's, I'm 14 years older. You need to have uh, angioplasty. And I just, you know, and it was, and, and it was awful. There was like no informed consent. It was like, you know, the same thing, like take this or you'll die. <laughs> same, same terrible pressure, both from the interns and the residents and the, you know, it was awful. And the next morning, finally, they admitted me and I had to agree to take a thallium stress test. Four hours later, they kicked me out of the hospital. They said, you're, I don't know, you're, you're, your volume going in and going out is perfect. You're fine. But they wanted to do a, an angioplasty in the worst way. Um, again, what's up with the standard of care in cardiology? Thank you. I, I'm sorry you had that experience. It sounds like that was pretty traumatic. Um, so angioplasty, the standard of care is not necessarily practiced everywhere by everyone, but what our societies recommend is that an angioplasty is definitely indicated or, or re, I should say revascularization, whether it be with an angioplasty or a bypass is indicated in the setting of an acute heart attack um, or an unstable cardiac event or in certain anatomical situations, such as if there is severe disease of the left main coronary artery or severe three vessel coronary artery disease. If you are an otherwise stable patient who um, has the incidental finding of a blocked artery, putting a stent in is not something that's going to reduce your risk of heart attack or stroke or, or prolong your life. Um, and that's something that when I, when I do procedures on my patients, I, I make very clear to them that if we're going to be doing an angioplasty, it's to open an artery and in, improve their, their symptoms. It's not necessarily to um, save their life. If in fact, I'm not taking care of them in the setting of an acute heart attack. Thanks, doctor. It looks like Stephen has a quick follow-up to that. Hey, Stephen. Yeah, like I said, there was no blocked artery. It sort of felt like the gastroenterologist with the with the colonoscopy, you know, I can see what's going on when I go in there, if there's a problem, that was the, that was the push. Okay. Unfortunately, not being there, I, I really can't comment on that. I'm sorry. That makes sense, doctor. Thanks very much. And uh, again, at the moment, I have no other raised hands. I'm going to go ahead. I've got another question for you. And that is, um, the whole food plant-based eaters need to get scans to check the health of their arteries. And if so, which ones? Okay, good question. So who needs to get scans of their arteries? And the short answer is, is no one. Um, it's if you're feeling well, and you're doing fine, and you're able to exercise, and you're not having problems, you don't, you don't need to have any type of artery scan or, or stress test. Um, I think it, it depends, regardless of what you're eating, it really depends on the clinical scenario. If you're somebody who's having symptoms, you have chest pain or shortness of breath, or you have a significantly abnormal EKG or, or some other significant findings, then that would indicate further workup, but we don't routinely do heart scans on people arbitrarily. Mm -hmm.